I do or do not have this disease, it cannot define me. It cannot define me. If it's my story, I get to choose whether I laugh or cry about it. It's my choice. I'm going to laugh about it. It's my day. It's my life. Carolyn and Cheryl are sisters who have lived for years with a mortal secret. Like a poison fruit, a genetic mutation hangs on the family tree. It killed their grandfather, their uncle, and in 1999 revealed itself in their mom, Barbara. I can remember saying, Mom, what's wrong? Why can't you speak? She couldn't speak because she could not sleep at all. Inside Barbara's brain, a genetic tripwire had been crossed, and in a matter of months, she went from being a vigorous 52-year-old woman to a coma, emerging only a few days at the very end. They took her intubation out, and she couldn't really talk because she was so dry-throated and everything, and she was trying to write, and she wrote FFI with a question mark behind it. And I said, that's what they think it is. And she just kind of went... <laughs> She never wanted to think it. She never wanted to will it to happen. FFI, fatal familial insomnia, is an extremely rare disease that inexorably steals a victim's sleep, their mind, and their life. It affects about 40 families worldwide. Barbara didn't know it when she died, but odds are 50-50 she passed it on to her daughters. Before this story is over, we will know which one of them has decided to learn her fate and which has chosen to remain in the dark. But to understand this disease, we must start in Italy, 250 years ago. Researchers believe a wealthy Venetian doctor unknowingly carried the original genetic mutation for FFI. But the experts simply refer to him as patient zero, the first known case of the disease. By the time he died in 1765, he had passed the gene and the curse to his children, and the chain had begun. In its first stages, family members experienced a kind of insomnia we'd all recognize, but those sleepless nights never ended. I'd say within a month, it's pretty clear that you've got a disease like no other disease. D.T. Max has spent years researching the phenomenon of FFI. His book, The Family That Couldn't Sleep, traces the history of the Italian clan who first carried this cruel disease. One, you're not sleeping. Two, you're having difficulty walking. Three, your, uh, your ability to focus has, has gone downhill rapidly until about ordinarily the ninth month the disease ends with death. Many of the afflicted Italian family members were brought here to San Servolo, an island asylum, just a short boat ride from Venice. Now a museum, San Servolo remains a haunting place. What would it have been like to walk inside these walls? There would be howls, there would be people doing uncontrollable behavior, there would be attendants chasing after them. I saw one room downstairs with leather restraints. Some of the treatment was simply just keeping these people from That's right. hurting each other. Generation after generation of this family was in the later stages of the disease were strapped to a bed at night. Records show that throughout the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, deaths consistent with FFI run down through the generations of this family. Then in the 1980s, a descendant of the family named Silvano suddenly began showing symptoms of the disease. This handsome, vibrant playboy had lived with the shadow of this potential killer all his life. Silvano looks as if he's sleepwalking, uh, but that is really because he's in a permanent state of pre-sleep behavior. Silvano and other family members were filmed at the University of Bologna's sleep clinic. Often you will see him and other patients performing gestures like combing their hair or washing their hands or handling objects. Silvano and the others were unable to drop into a deep REM sleep and sleep medications only accelerated their restless descent toward death. We gave an intravenous doses of barbiturates in an attempt to help the patient sleep. The result was that they went from this pre-sleep, non-sleep to deep coma without ever passing through a sleep stage. Just prior to his death, Silvano made a selfless offer, bequeathing his brain to researchers, which finally opened a window into the mystery of FFI. When we come back, inside the patient's brain and two sisters face their fate 
Which one will find out if they have FFI? Stay with us. Victims of fatal familial insomnia, FFI, are forever trying and failing to fall asleep. Before dying, they hover for months in a twilight world. But when Silvano first, and then later victims, donated their brains to be studied, scientists finally began to understand the cause of the disease. Microscopic views show healthy proteins triggered by genetic mutations misfold, creating what doctors call prions. These abnormal proteins build up in the brain, forming clumps which destroy nerve cells and eventually leave sponge-like holes in the brain. As a class, prion diseases include both mad cow disease and FFI. In fatal familial insomnia, most of the damage and where the prions are accumulating seems to be in an area of the brain called the thalamus. And the thalamus, says Dr. Michael Geshwin, who studies FFI at the University of California at San Francisco, is the region of the brain responsible for the regulation of sleep. The accumulation of the prion in the brain leads to nerve cell injury and eventually to nerve cell death. But for reasons still not fully understood, symptoms of FFI don't show up until midlife, after childbearing years. With each child having a 50-50 chance of receiving the killer gene, the disease has been unwittingly passed through generations, which brings us back to sisters Carolyn and Cheryl, whose mother was only diagnosed with FFI on her deathbed. It was never presented to me until that moment. Yes, your grandfather died of this, your uncle died of this, your mother is dying of this, you may die of this, was what was unspoken. Given the opportunity to take a simple blood test to determine if they had inherited the disease, Cheryl said no. For me, I look at it as, I can go and they can tell me that either I do have this or I don't have this, and I can die in a car accident on the way home. I may just as easily die from cancer or anything. There must be days when you, you want to know. What if I said you may have it? And not to be rude. No, go ahead. Of what? <laughs> no, I mean, it's the same a, thing. No, it's a, good, it's a good question. Would I want to know? We all have a terminal something. If we live long enough, we're going to die from something. It's the way it goes. And amazingly, Carolyn, a mother, also originally decided not to be tested for FFI. How, how'd you make that decision? It wasn't a decision, really. It wasn't even a consideration. It wasn't a consideration? It's not a consideration, really. Is it a question, should my mother never have been born because this is the way she was going to die? That's insane. But as Carolyn moved into the last months of her second pregnancy, she had a change of heart and mind, revealed in this remarkable interview taped just weeks after she decided to take the blood test. So what made you do the test? We'd already had one child. Yeah, it's hanging over my head all the time. There's some things that I will do differently depending on the results, like retirement planning. I don't want to be like my mom and work my whole life and save for retirement that I'm never going to get. And if that's going to be the case, I'd like to be able to prepare my daughters, you know, ahead of time. So Carolyn had the test, and we will know the results in a moment. In the meantime, research into FFI and prion diseases may eventually lead to breakthroughs in more common disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Our hope is that some patients may actually do even better than having their life prolonged, that maybe in some patients it will actually cure them. Until then, FFI remains a deadly destiny for those who have received the fatal gene. Carolyn, pregnant and worried, remembers well the day her blood test came back. I left work, I went to the office, I waddled in, <laughs> took my envelope, went out to my car, took a deep breath, and opened it up. The results? Negative. No FFI. That was a, an hallelujah moment. <laughs> so Carolyn has her hallelujah moment, while Cheryl, without a blood test, prefers to continue living moment to moment.